Well, good morning. Uh, so glad you're here with us today. Uh, just to let you know, uh, Pastor Jesse and Holly and their family are off uh, there in San Diego dropping off Steyer. And so they, if you've experienced it, they're getting that experience of dropping their first child off at college. And then uh, the Newtons, uh, many of you know Pastor Matt and his wife, Alanda, they're also doing the same thing with Brady. And so uh, be praying for all the parents that are doing that first year drop off. Uh, be praying, I would say, honestly, for our college students. You know, I get the opportunity and the privilege of every week uh, working with our 18 to 24-year-olds. It's an amazing group. They have an amazing pastor, if they didn't know. Um, no, just kidding. Some of you are like, oh, I get it. Um, and so, no, but um, a lot, we have a lot of students over the next couple of weeks going back to school. And a lot of times we say like, hey, pray for their protection to that. I would say as you think about our college students that are going off to school, pray for their boldness. Um, our campuses need Jesus in this country. And so um, I would just say, yeah, we could. So just pray that God uses them and they see people come to faith because God placed them exactly where they need to be. Um, with that said, we are jumping back into Genesis today. We've been off for the last couple of weeks. And so we're gonna be in Genesis chapter 44 and 45, so if you have your Bibles, you can open there. i just give you a heads up. We're going to look at verses throughout each of these chapters, but it is a lot of text um, to try to get through in 30 minutes, less than that, 28 minutes. And so um, we're gonna fly through some of this. We're just gonna look at chunks of it and really uh, kind of pull out some truths that we see in the story of Joseph and his brothers. If you've missed the last couple weeks that we were in Genesis or just being out, I know how it goes, uh, you might not realize or might not remember exactly where we're at. So let me give you a quick recap to get you caught up to where we're gonna be at today. So we've been looking at the life of Joseph for a number of weeks now, and we see in his life, it is a life filled with very high highs and very low lows. Like, uh, it doesn't seem, at least what we get in scripture, any middle ground. It's like things are awesome for him and, or things are ter terrible for him. Uh, for the beginning of his story, for instance, we start off like he is clearly his father's favorite. Uh, his father favors him. Uh, he lives the good life. Uh, remember, Joseph is the firstborn son Son of the wife that Jacob truly loves. Remember, Jacob has four wives. Only one of them does he truly love. And so Joseph comes out of that marriage. And then his younger brother, Benjamin, comes out of that marriage. And we'll look a little bit more at Benjamin in just a few moments. But Joseph is the favorite. It's so obvious he's the favorite. Remember, his dad loves him so much, he gives him that special jo jacket, right? Um, when they're sitting around the campfire and his brothers are freezing, he's like, I'm warm. I'm in my like colored jacket. How about you guys, you know? And he is the favorite. They hate him because of this, right? This isn't sibling rivalry like you may have had with your brother or sister growing up, kind of that healthy rivalry where you could beat on your brother, but if someone else talks about him, you'll beat them up. It's not that, right? This is they hate him. They are jealous of him. Joseph doesn't help his cause. He has dreams that God has given him that one day he will be in a position of authority. And because of that, his brothers will all bow down to him. We actually see that come to fruition in our text today. And, and so how he doesn't help his cause in the midst of this is he actually, he has these dreams and instead of just going to his dad saying, hey dad, I had these crazy dreams. I think God's telling me something. He goes to his brothers and remember he's one of the youngest and he's like, one day you will all bow to me. You know, like imagine if you're the older brothers, you're like, you're not hearing that well, you're right. You're like, oh, someone's bowing. It's not me. You know, like, and so he tells them that. And so they're just, their jealousy and their hatred for them just gets stronger and stronger. And so what they do is they come up with a plan uh, to kill him. They end up not killing him, but they sell him. Uh, Jacob, the father, now believes this favorite son of his is passed away. He goes into deep mourning. Joseph is sold into Egypt as a slave, but he does so well. God's hand is on him. He actually raised, is lifted up in the household to be put in charge of the house. The owner of the house gives him everything except his wife, but his wife found him incredibly good looking. It doesn't say that in scripture, but she went after him like sexually numerous times, right? Uh, Joseph is a man of character and integrity, and he's like, I want nothing to do with you. So fellows, right, if we're tempted sexually, we need to follow Joseph's example and flee. He does that. I don't know why he leaves something, he leaves a garment behind. It's like, dude, you should have grabbed that. But he leaves it behind. She then accuses him of raping her. He goes to prison. In prison, again, God's hand is on him. He is placed second command of the prison. He ends up interpreting some dreams for men that work for the Pharaoh. 
Then he gets to stand before Pharaoh. He interprets the dreams of Pharaoh. And in that moment, Pharaoh elevates him into second command of the nation, of the most powerful nation of the world at the time. So Joseph, incredibly powerful, high highs, low lows. We pick up his story. The famine in Egypt begins. So Joseph had interpreted that these years of famine were coming. Famine begins in the land. His brothers come from their homeland to Egypt to buy food. In that moment, Joseph recognizes them. And we've walked through all this. So I'm not going to recap all of that. But Joseph recognizes them, accuses them of being spies. Then says, you need to leave a brother behind to prove your story. So they do that. They go home. They eat all their food. They're out of food. The dad is like, I don't want you to go back because if you go back, you now have to take my new favorite, Benjamin, because he's now the only remaining son from the wife he loves. And they're like, without going back, without Benjamin, we all starve, we all die. So they go back and they stand before Joseph. They bow before him. And this is kind of where we pick up our story, right? And so we're gonna look at verses four, or chapter 44, and we're going to see in 44 and 45, we're going to see that relationships are healed. And this comes after years of hurt and brokenness. This family is dysfunctional. There's been so much damage. But yet we're going to see God do an amazing work through Joseph and his brothers. And we're going to see these relationships get healed and be brought back together. So let's start with verse 1. It says, Then he commanded the steward of his house, Fill the man's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest. So, right, their food, their sacks get filled up. They throw their money back in it. This has happened before, but then Joseph, he knows the birth order. He has his favorite cup. Uh, There's there's things about this cup. We're not gonna dive into it, but it's his his favorite cup. I, I don't know if you have a favorite cup. Like, I have a favorite cup, and I know it's super lame, but every single morning, I wake up, I have coffee in the same chair, in the same, like, with the same, Starbucks Sacramento cup. Like literally I had family in town last week. My parents came in. One of them used my cup. Like they need to repent of this. Um, like, I don't understand. It's like clearly my cup. It says Sacramento on it. You know, and so like, um, I, so this is Joseph's coffee cup, right? Um, it is his prize cup. He puts it in Benjamin's sack. And, and so the steward does it. He said, scripture says he did as Joseph told him. Verse three, as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, up, follow after the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not from this that my Lord drinks and by this that he practices divination? You have done evil in doing this. So the the steward has to be wondering, what the heck is Joseph doing here? Like, first we give him his money back. Then we put a special cup. Like, where's he going to drink coffee at the next morning? Like, and we put that in the bag. And then you say, go chase after them. And so he does everything he says, catches them, right? And goes through the sack. We're not going to read all. Well, we'll see a little bit of that in a moment. But here, Joseph, what he's doing is he's actually providing a test. In this moment, he's testing his brothers here in order to see who they have become. Have they changed? Remember, it's been over 20 years at this point. Have their hearts changed? Have their lives changed? And this really is an opportunity for Joseph to evaluate who they have become. Right? He's trying to see, like, are these men different? Are these brothers of mine? Because remember, he knows who they are, and they do not yet know who he is. Right? And so here they have Benjamin, the new, most likely the new favored child. And these brothers, they could have let him be arrested because he's the favored one. If they were the same people as they were 20 years ago, they'd probably say, like, take him. Like, I'd rather live, I'd rather be free than be imprisoned or be killed for this crime. And so Joseph in this test is really setting them up to evaluate what kind of character. Has God moved in their lives? Has God shaped them? Has God changed them? And this test would really reveal who they are. Had they changed? Did they grow from their mistake that they had made years before that? After watching their father grieve, did that do anything in their lives? Did it lead to any change? And then we see their response. Joseph gets this response in verses 18 through 34. And again, we're not going to read all of these verses, but we're going to look at a few of them. We're going to look at verses 12 through 17. It says, and he searched. So this is the steward and beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes and every man loaded his donkey and they returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. 
Joseph said to them, what deed is this you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? And Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also whose hand the cup has been found. So this first response is one of absolute despair. The text tells us they tore their clothes. Now this was a sign when you would see this in ancient times when people would tear their clothes. It was a sign of going into a, a period of mourning or weeping and grieving. It's what one would do in preparation for a funeral. And so they are in absolute despair. It is likely they thought in that moment that they may be attending their own funeral or the funeral of Benjamin, the one they promised to the father that they would protect and bring back at all costs. And so you see this immediate reaction of just despair. Second, we see Judah's heart has been changed. He is not who he once was. First, we see him step up as the spokesman of the family. Reuben is actually the eldest brother, and he should have been the one having this conversation. But Judah steps into this. In fact, the speech we have between Judah and Joseph is the longest speech of a man recorded in the book of Genesis. And so Judah steps in, right? And he does so humbly, right? He comes before Joseph, and he refers to him as my Lord eight times. And I think the last thing, but probably the most powerful thing we see out of the life of Benjamin in this moment is, or in the life of Judah in this moment, is he steps in to be a substitute for Benjamin. Look at verses 33 and 34. It says, now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Judah's changed. He is willing to lay down his life for his brother. He is ready to sacrifice everything. And at this moment in his life, Judah is a father. He's a husband, right? He has become a leader in the family and he is willing to lay it all down for Benjamin. But this is a, a huge contrast to who Judah was 20 years before this, where Judah was the one saying, let's get rid of Joseph. Right? Judah was trying to step in as the substitute for Benjamin. You know, I know this story as we look at it is primarily about Joseph. But in this little short passage, we actually get a glimpse of Jesus. Judah really here is a foreshadowing of who is to come. Because Judah steps in, is offering to step in to be the substitute for Benjamin. Benjamin was the one that was guilty. He was the one caught with the cup. And Judah says, I will take his guilt. Do you know who else does that a few thousand years later? Jesus. Jesus steps in as our substitute. We deserve guilt. We are guilty. We deserve the punishment. Yet Jesus steps in as our substitute. Paul says it this way in Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Jesus steps in as our substitute. He paid the price we cannot pay for our sin and our guilt, and yet he steps in and he takes our place. Judah is offering to do the exact same thing for his brother Benjamin, which is completely character shift from what he was 20 years prior. And Joseph is watching this. And Joseph is seeing this change. And he sees this heart that is so different and he can't take it and Joseph then reveals who he is because Joseph's heart is broken and he breaks out in weeping. Jump to chapter 45, verses one through three. It says, then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out for me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers and he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But the brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. First, just a little side off for a moment. I think, fellas, we need to learn something from Joseph in this moment. Joseph was man enough and vulnerable enough to cry. Amen. And he, it, this wasn't like a little soft cry. This wasn't like when you're sitting there, you don't, you're like, oh, I just choked up. Like, that's not what like, oh, my eyes were just a little watery. Joseph was welling here. He was crying so hard that people outside of the home heard him, that they even went and told Pharaoh what was going on. Fellas, we need, part of leading our families is one, to be vulnerable over the sin in our lives, that it would break us and we would be willing to cry about it. When we see brokenness in our family or in our world, that we would be willing to, to cry about it.
about it. The whole idea that we may have been raised with or we even raise our boys with, like, hey, men don't cry, that's a lie. That is not godliness. So fellas, if, when God breaks our heart, it is okay to weep before God. Joseph does it, and you know who else does it? Jesus. Right, Jesus, when you go back to Lazarus, Lazarus is dead. Jesus knows he's going to raise him from the dead. Jesus knows this, but he weeps for his friends. And so, fellas, there are times, like really the Hebrew description here is like, Joseph had a really good cry. And I know sometimes we tell our wives, do you need a good cry? Sometimes, like we do. And so if you need to go to some sad love story movie to have your good cry in a theater all by yourself, like go, go see it ends with us, right? And, and just get it out. Back to what we see in the story. Joseph in this moment speaks to them in Hebrew and he draws them in. And the phrase in the Hebrew is actually very similar language that's used throughout scripture of how God wants to draw his children close to him. And so in this moment, Joseph isn't angry. Joseph isn't seeking vengeance. He wants to draw them in and say, you're my brothers. It's a way for Joseph to show them that he loves them and that he cares for them. But imagine in this moment, if you're those brothers, I mean, scripture tells us they couldn't even answer him because they were dismayed. They were shocked. But I bet they were also terrified. The one that we sold into slavery is now second in command. Imagine the thoughts that must have been flowing through their minds in that moment. Like, oh no, it's the end of us. Like we are, he is gonna punish us. He is going, to, like, I, I'm sure all those thoughts were going in my mind. And he's saying, no brothers, come here. Come close. What he's doing here is he's assuring them of their safety. He's t speaking very clearly that what they meant for evil, God used for good. Look what he says, and look what happens in verses five through eight. It says, and now, and this is Joseph talking, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and keep it alive for as many survivors. So it was not you who sent me, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Right? We see here Joseph had walked through some amazing healing. Joseph allowed God to completely shape his heart and perspective. Joseph confidently knew that God used what had happened in his life to get him to the moment he was at, to get him to that position. Right? God does this. God uses circumstances, and he could take horrible things and use them for good. Paul says it in Romans 8, right? And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, let me clarify here. Paul does not say all things are good. He says that all things work together for good. And so there are things in your life, or some of you have probably experienced things in your life and walked through seasons that they are not good. And you could say that they are not good. You could say that they were terrible, horrible, hurtful. You could say all those things. What Paul is saying, what Joseph experienced is God took those horrible things and he was able to use those things for good. And so Joseph, he trusted God in that and he saw where God had placed him and is using him. Right? He had gone through healing. He allowed God to move in his heart. And this is what we see an incredibly healthy person in Joseph because it takes a very healthy person to unburden the people that cause pain. And that's what he does in this moment. And this is what God can do for each one of us if we allow him to. And then lastly, at the end of chapter 45, we see the reunion and this family begins to heal. Joseph sends them to get the rest of the family and to come back to where they could be taken care of. Verses nine and 10 says, hurry and go to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. So not only does Joseph do this, but if you read throughout 45, Pharaoh says, go get your family, bring them back, sends them with all the supplies they would need to bring them back. And he brings them to the area of Egypt called Goshen, which in Hebrew means Paradise Valley. So not only did they bring him back, but they brought his family back and gave them the best real estate in all of Egypt. And this family then goes on and begins to heal. This family of absolute dysfunction experiences healing. Right, this story has so much. I have two chapters, there's a ton in these chapters. And as we, we didn't read every verse, but this story, while it is filled with so much, is really about healing. 
And so over the next few moments, what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time looking at what healed relationships required and what we can get out of this story and walk into our lives with or apply to our lives with. And so first off, healed relationships require confession. Healing cannot begin to happen if confession does not take place. And let me just say a little caveat here. Like, scripture tells us very clearly that we need to do everything we can to be at peace with others. There is a point where we cannot make others respond. And so I, we're not gonna go in, like today is not all on forgiveness. We could spend a few weeks on that. But I, I do wanna th just put that out there. But for the, this, the rest of our time is really more about relationships that we can have dialogue with, that we could, or, or steps we may need to take to see healing. And so, like I said, confession must take place. We see this in Judah. Right, he confessed the sin of he and his brothers to Joseph. In verse 16 of chapter 44, when he says, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? And here's the confession. God has found out the guilt of your servants. Most scholars believe right there, he is referring to what they did to Joseph years prior to that moment. Right? They knew the guilt they had been living with. Right? And they believed in this moment they were receiving the punishment for it. And so Judah confesses his sin to Joseph. But that's not the only confession that takes place in this story. They have to go home. Remember, they're the ones that broke the news to dad that their, his favorite son had been killed. So then they have to go home and confess to their father that Joseph is still alive. And in that text, it says, it's talking about Jacob, his heart became numb. The Hebrew word there actually means he basically had a heart attack. This was a heavy, heavy moment in which they had to confess to their father what had taken place. And so confession had to happen. And in order for healing to take place, there might be someone that we need to go and we may need to confess sin to or confess that we have done something to wrong them. If we are going to experience healing, we must be willing to confess. And I would say we need to start our confession to God. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there may be some of you right now that you know there is brokenness in your life. There might be brokenness between you and God. There might be brokenness between you and other people. You need to start before God and confess your sin to God. Second, you need to confess your sin to the people that you've hurt. Right, James 5.16 says, confess your sin to one another, pray for one another, one another, that you may be what? Healed. Healing doesn't happen without confession. So let me ask you, is that a step you need to take? Second, healed relationships require forgiveness. This could be hard. And again, this is not a full message on forgiveness. I know there's so much we could cover, but we don't have time for all that this morning. But I understand forgiveness can be hard, but we have to remember this. We don't forgive because we feel like it. We forgive because God forgave us. Paul says, Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Remember, we do not deserve God's forgiveness, but we receive it because of Jesus. And so there are gonna be seasons in our life, there may be broken relationships that we have where we do not feel like forgiving them. But I'll tell you what, we are not asked to do that. We are told to do that in scripture. So forgiveness is a must. We are to forgive. I want to remind you that often forgiveness has more to do with you and God than it does you and the other person. And so I would challenge you, if you are holding on to bitterness, to hurt, I would challenge you to walk through this with the Lord and come to a place where you will forgive because it is something you are to do, not something to do if you feel like it. Right? Forgiveness often requires us being in a healthy place as we saw in Joseph. I'm sure this took time. Joseph had 20 years for God to work and it may take you some time, but you need to allow God to work on your heart. So last thing I would say on this, forgiveness is a must, trust is a maybe. And so to heal healed relationships, I believe require a process to trust. Right? We see this in Joseph. He watched for two years. I know we read it as back-to-back -back chapters and we think, oh, it happened fast, but there's many scholars that believe from the first visit of his brothers to the visit we're looking at today was about a two-year period. And we know he kept Simeon in jail that time. And so Joseph was watching his brothers. He didn't just forgive. They didn't just show up the first time and he's like, brothers! Like, that's not what he does. 
He walks them through a test. Right? He wants to see, did they change? Can I trust them? One author said this, trust is a precious commodity and we must do well to maintain it because trust takes time to build but can be destroyed in a moment. Right, so we must forgive, but we need to be wise in how we rebuild trust. Remember, Jesus was wise about who he trusted. Jesus did not just trust everyone. John 2, 24 says, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. Right, Jesus was wise. He was careful in who he trusted, and we ought to do the same. But people need, once that trust is broken, we need to put a process in place where that trust can be earned. If someone breaks it, we have to forgive, but before the relationship can be fully restored, trust must be earned. And so if you are in this point, I would encourage you, develop a process that allows a person to earn that trust again. Now with that, I would just say, that needs to be done with proper motives and methods. Because you are in the position and asking someone to trust you, you do not have the right to lord authority over them and to manipulate and misuse them. And so I just caution you with that. Don't be hurtful with it. Do it with the proper motives, proper methods. Lastly, I'd say this, healed relationships require reconciliation. Church, God is a God of reconciliation. Paul says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. We are only in relationship with God because he allowed Jesus to pay a price we could not pay so that we could be reconciled to him. Right, this word reconciliation or reconciled means to once more make peaceful, to restore. So we have to think it this way. Prior to the fall, man was at peace with God. Man broke that peace, then God restored it through Jesus. And so we are reconciled to God through Jesus. God has paved the way for us to be in relationship with him. If we are a Christ follower, we are told in scripture to be reconcilers, to have a ministry of reconciliation. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come, all this from God, who through Christ reconciled himself to us, and then this part, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. As new creations, Creations that are to more closely reflect Jesus, we are to be a people of reconciliation, right? And I know that this could be easy to talk about. It is easy to tell other people about it, but I think we have to ask the question, is there someone in our lives that we need to reconcile with? I get it. I know in a family this size, some of you are sitting here today like, Josh, I'm good. That's great for you. But I also know in a family this size, there's a number of you that are like, oh, I should have missed. Who is it? Who is it right now you know I need to walk through this process with? I'd just say over the last couple minutes, just a few words to encourage you, a question to ask, like bring healing to your life. I just want to encourage you to bring healing to your life and your relationship just by first I'd say probably similar to Joseph, allow God to work in your heart. A lot of times when we're hurt, we just build these walls. And God's trying to chip at those walls. I'd encourage you, go have a good cry. Let those walls start coming down and allow God to work. Is there bitterness that you need to work through? Go to God with these Allow him to be able to work in the, and work through that hurt in your life. Right, Joseph allowed God to do this, and because of this, he experienced healing. He experienced freedom and purpose. Second, I would just encourage you, bring healing into your life by believing God can reshape lives. Church, Judah was a mess. They don't, I, Judah like, was not a man we would say like, we should emulate. This is a guy that he wanted his brother dead. He slept with a prostitute that ended up being his daughter-in-law. Like, how creepy is that? Right? The guy was an absolute mess. But you know what the crazy thing about this story is? Jesus doesn't come from the line of Joseph. He comes from the line of Judah. And so if 
God could do a work through a mess like that. What, he, what could he do in the lives of people that have possibly hurt you? Or maybe in your life if you've hurt people. But it starts by believing that the same God that changed Judah is the same God that can shape you or the person that hurt you. Lastly, you just follow the example of Joseph and Judah we see in 44 and 45. Be willing to forgive. Be willing to confess. Be willing to find a way forward. And so as we just close our time, what I just want to do, I'm going to go, most of you know, I've been involved in student ministries for like 26 years, so I'm going to go student ministry on you. Some of you know exactly where I'm heading. There's no band coming out, so we're not going to have the soft background music. <laughs> but I am going to ask that you would just close your eyes where you're at. Because I just want to ask a personal question, have an opportunity to be able to pray for you. If you're one of those, you're here this morning and you're in the midst of, you know that broken relationship. Maybe you're on the side that caused the hurt. Maybe you're on the side that received the hurt. And you need to walk through some of those steps. I just want to pray for you. And so if that's you this morning, if you're willing, if you would just raise your hand where you're at. Anyone else? Let's just pray together for a moment. Father, you saw every hand that was raised. Lord, I I don't know what the story is behind each one of those hands, but that doesn't matter. What matters is you do. Lord, I just pray for every single person, whether they are the one that maybe caused the hurt and they need to go seek reconciliation or they're the one that was hurt and they need to be open to it, Lord. I ask that you would just move in that situation, Lord. That you would, if reconciliation's possible, Lord, that you would bring it, Lord, and you would allow healing to take place, Lord. And that at the end of this, Father, it would be your name that's lifted high because you did a mighty work. And so again, Lord, as each one of those hands was raised, I ask, Lord, you would just give them the courage to do what needs to be done, to take the step that needs to be taken when they walk out of here this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that a story from thousands of years ago applies to us today. Lord, and lastly, we just thank you for Jesus, that he was our substitute, Lord, and that he reconciled us to you, Father. Lord, we just thank you for him and for what was accomplished through his life, Father. And it's in your name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks for being here today. I hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next week.